Now we move on to the first of our panel discussions. And we're going to have a day where we're going to think about many different aspects of learning and education and focus very heavily on science and technology. But we thought we ought to begin in the broadest possible sense by asking what is education for? What is the purpose of education? And to investigate that, I'm delighted to welcome four panelists. Anyong Choi, who's a chemistry teacher from the Korean Science Academy. Lynn Goodwin, who's professor of education at Boston College. Kostya Novoselov, 2010 Nobel Laureate in Physics. And Jul Razak, who's the rector of the International Islamic University in Malaysia. So, please, welcome them. You're here. There's a seating... I think we do... Oh, that you've disrupted the seating plan. They, they, had, they had you alphabetical. I think it probably matters for the microphones. Lynn, you, you should be here, okay. I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, ah, and, yeah, okay. and Kostya there. I think, for some reason, it, it, technically it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, during this session, I'm also going to ask the audience to participate with some questions and comments. So please be ready to raise your hand when I point. Um, before this meeting, we asked the audience if they would send us some videos of what they think the purpose of education is. And it's pretty scary to hold your phone and record a video. And so I'm incredibly grateful to those brave souls who gave it a go. And we'd like to play just a very short video showing some of their responses. <laughs> I think education is one of our most basic human instincts. Just like eating and sleeping, humans naturally have a thirst of... Education is not just about growing intellectually, but also to help us become a better person. The discovery of one's talents and weaknesses and how to overcome those specific challenges. I personally think that education is meant for the advancement of our society. Education is a means to address inequality. That's because resources are limited, so you have to use them smartly. So scientists study better ways and educate people with each. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. It's interesting that those comments are very broad brush as well, but people seem to have risen above the task of passing exams and thinking about education in a much broader way. Lynn, let's start with you. What do you think the purpose of education is, and how would you, how would you follow on from Liz Cho's talk? So I'm really happy, actually, to follow from Liz Cho's really inspiring and excellent talk, because her focus is on a purpose in education that I think we have strayed far from, with our attention being diverted to human capital um, and to economies and how to make sure that children develop the skills that they need in order to fuel, to drive um, economics. Education is supposed to be the great equalizer. And I'm here to, to, in some ways, agree with Liz Cho to say that in many ways education has become the great de-equalizer or dis-equalizer, that has become a tool for separating and marginalizing and sorting and ranking children into those who deserve a good education and those who don't. So if I think about uh, Liz Cho's talk and if I look at these uh, short videos, what has the focus been? On being a good human being, on being able to develop your capacities, on learning, not necessarily achieving. Hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Jewel, would you like to follow on from that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very exciting time to talk about education. But I thought education is about you, just like what the speakers have been saying. It's about you and how do you know yourself. You go back to the days of the Greeks, education is always framed as know thyself. Unless you know who you are, in other words, unless you educate yourself in that sense, you will not be able to function in the society at large. So to me, education is about how to repurpose education. We've got talks like, you know, what is the heart of education? Some people say education, heart of education, is education of the heart. In fact, Plato was said that if you educate without the heart, then it doesn't mean that education at all. So I think we need to go back to the very basics 
of first being human being. So all the things that have been talked about, being kind, being caring, and all the spirit things and spiritual things that we talked about are the fundamentals of education. We need to start from that. I would rather believe that I'm a spiritual native rather than a digital native. I know who I am, and then I can then deal with whatever else that I need to deal with from my point of view. And that is what connects us all of us. We are all human beings. Korean, Malaysian, wherever we come from, we are all human beings. And that is the glue that connects us. And if you lose that glue, then you begin to think of yourself in segmentation way. And this is where the problem of education is all about. And I'm very glad to see that everybody is saying, no, let's not just talk about STEM, let's talk about STEAM, for example. Where's arts? Where's management? Where's ethics? We cannot deal with science without all these things. So bring this back together, Adam, is what I think education is all about. It is not, it's not new, but we need to go back and repurpose education for what it is meant to be. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's, let's have everyone's comments on this first. Kostya, would you, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I've been thinking for quite a while about this, this uh, section, how can I, in one minute, summarize what is the, what, what is the purpose of education? And I think uh, planting the seeds of the critical thinking into, into our brain is probably the, the simplest way to, to, to describe it, because we are born with very um, animalistic uh, instincts in our, in our brain, so it's, uh, it, it works for in, in, in quite a few circumstances, but there are cases when we really need to demonstrate uh, that we are human beings, and this rational thinking and critical thinking is really what 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 uh, distinguish us from uh, from uh, any other species. And and but this would, uh, that has to be uh, brought into you. So you, you have to be educated to. Uh, to 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 have this uh, this rationale in your in your brain, and I think that's you, that, that's the measure that's the measure purpose, and of course as um, uh, any uh, neural network or machine learning, you still need data to make the to make the to to predict the, the next step, and 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 that's what is also required. I would generally avoid. Uh, 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 mixing knowledge and education together, but actually some knowledge are, uh, are also important to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to provide this critical thinking uh, apparatus into your, into your brain. And the, and the last one, I think, uh, curiosity. So just bringing curiosity into, uh, in, 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 into yourself. So there was this beautiful video that we are, as human beings, we are fundamentally curious. That's, that's true, but actually I think it's uh, encouraging further curiosity is, is, is a purpose of education as well. Thank you very much indeed. So very nicely the three of you have introduced the heart and society and the mind into this discussion. All of these need to be taken, um, taken into account when talking about this. Um, uh, Yun Yong, Yun -Yong mm -hmm. you are a chemistry teacher dealing yeah, right. with a very highly selected group of students. Yeah, very, yeah, right. <laughs> so much like many of the students who are with us in the, in the, uh, in the room today, mm -hmm. very t a very talented, successful bunch of students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do, how do you approach it, and how do the comments that have been made so far oh. ref relate to how you approach your students? Yeah, all right. It's uh, creativity, passion. They are commented about creativity, right? Passion, challenge. Since the head of Shin Sinjo is commented, challenge, importance, right? So, all right. And uh, uh, today, I want to keep importance on the resilience and competence. Uh, yeah, it's also. Resilience and competence. Re, yeah, resilience and competence. I'm chemistry teacher, right? <laughs> <laughs> so look at the chemistry world. Chemistry world can be divided by three words, right? Chem is try. Try, try is very important, right? Important <laughs> challenge, right? So uh, we have to try. Students have to try and fail, try and fail. Those, through those experiences, they can overcome, right? They can overcome and they can develop their resilience. I think that is also important. Creativity is also important, but I think resilience is very, very important because they can try again, 
right? They can develop their, their resilience. They finally they can be confident, right? So actually, uh, probably some people ask me, uh, they are, uh, you asked me, right, yesterday, they are so young, right, to develop, uh, to, to right, overcome the failure, but teachers should be there, right? Yeah, we can help them. We can support them to, to overcome their failure. And then the, the experience can be developed, can develop resilience and finally confidence. Mm. Yeah, actually proud have their own time to bloom, right? So teachers can wait for them and they can develop their resilience and they can be confident. And also we have to, uh, we will provide, actually our school is a kind of pioneer in the kind of high school. We are the first school for the science gifted students. So we actually provided many, many programs, right? Kind of research, can I, can I talk more? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. maybe in a minute. Yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give everyone a chance. Uh, uh, yeah. But yes, your pioneering approach, mm -hmm. um, teaching people that failure is okay. And I mm. love the idea of allowing them to bloom. Mm. Um, that's something, Lynn, mm. coming back to you, that you know, not, education doesn't often feel as if it allows students to bloom in their own time. It's too pressured. Mm. You're right. Um, and it goes back to the very beginning of schooling when we were trying to sort of manage and organize massive numbers of young people. Um, and so we sorted them by age and we sorted them by grade um, without a whole lot of attention to the fact that there are you know, multiple diversities in any group. Uh, you know that from your own families. Uh, your brothers and sisters are going to be very, very different from you even though you grew up in the same environment you know, with the same uh, parents or family. Um, so the idea that our brains continue to develop through our, our lives, that Learning is a developmental process, and it doesn't happen on a particular schedule. Um, that there are folks who are sort of quick out of the blocks um, as learners, and others who are more of a slow burn and need uh, a bit more time, um, not because they have, quote, special needs, but because they're different kinds of learners. Schools are just not designed mm -hmm. um, and have not been designed mm -hmm. um, to accommodate the human being as mm. a learner. Schools have been designed as managing organizations mm. to get people through, mm. um, you know, sort of a schooling experience mm -hmm. to an end goal, which is a, a diploma or a degree. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll connect to Liz Cho again when she started out with all those wonderful rhetorical things that people say about what education should be. And we say it all the time. Mm. Those words are not new to any of us. But living up to those words continues to be a challenge. And part of that challenge is connected again to that sort of ranking and sorting, where fundamentally we have yet to truly enact a deep belief that every child is a learner, is capable, and is worthy of a good education. Enough love for every child is not happening yet um, in our society. And we make our decisions based on that, how we spend our money, where the best teachers go, how schools are resourced, the list just goes on. So I think there's a lot of reckoning that we need to face. Mm. Mm. Does anybody want to jump in on that? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> I think that's a, a very interesting point that unfortunately over the, uh, over the years our schools turned into NHS GPs. They, 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 don't, they, they don't really provide care, they provide just a barrier between, be, between you and the, uh, uh, and the health care. So they, they just provide this selection pathway and then, and, then, and, and then just kick and try to sort people out rather than pro pro provide education, not even, uh, not even knowledge. So that's, uh, and, and, and that's been a tradition for many, many years and I think, I think it, it has to be changed in, in, in the future. Mm. I'd like to, um, to come back to the idea of reform. Somebody talked about reform. What sort of reform are we talking about? From my point of view, I think education has shifted a great deal because of the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s. Schools and universities now, to me, is no more than a factory. It's just how, how people produce goods. We are one of those products. We are called products anyway. And we are supposed to be marketed somewhere. 
And this is where I think the whole idea of education has shifted. I think we need to go back to what education is all about. And this mm -hmm. reformation is something that I think we need to think back. And I, I talk about repurposing because education, when it started, it started to be a better human being. Mm -hmm. How do you create a better human being in a society? Mm -hmm. School is about a small society that we learn how to function with mm -hmm. before you go into a larger society. Mm -hmm. That's almost like a real lab. How do you function in a, in a school which is a society that you need to practice whatever you learn to be a better human being, to create a balanced society, to create peaceful and harmonies. But if you don't do that in school, then the moment you go out in a larger society with a lot more challenges, you will not be able to function. And the pandemic tells us this very, very clearly. Most of the schools have to close. Most industries have to close because we are not able to cope. There's no resiliency. The coping mechanisms of in, terms, in terms of emotion, for example, are not there. So suicide rates are going up and all the other things that we know about. The next pandemic I'm worried about will be your mental health. Until and unless we deal with mental health as part of education, it's not something that you're going to sidestep or you know, push it aside because it has no economic value, mm -hmm. and therefore you don't teach them. It will, go, it will come back and hound mm -hmm. you. So the whole idea of reformation, I think, needs to be very clearly understood of where we need to move and to lift up human beings in a very dignified way, I agree with Lynn. How do you level up society at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. If that fails, then I think education has failed in the general sense. Mm. Salutary words. Thank you. Okay. Resilience again. I'd love to get some comments from the audience. Um, you are, most of you are either in education, looking at all the wonderful students in front of us, or involved in education, or are educators. Does anybody have a question or comment? Raise your hand and wave it so that I can see, please. Anybody? Here's one. Can we have a microphone? Sure. Grace is running towards you with a microphone. Here we go. Thank you very much indeed. OK, thank you for all the panels for the good comments on our education. And I can agree more to Lin's comment that education should, be act, should act as an equalizer. Mm -hmm. But recently, it's acting more like a um, de-equalizer. So I want to ask that, like, uh, recently in Korea, we are facing the problem about the education for the gifted. So what do you think, like, which way is better, like, educating everybody in every same direction or segregating the people, like, classifying them as the where they are gifted and give the education separately. Thank, thank you very much for the question. So that's a difficult one, which many people have wrestled with. Do you, <laughs> do you segregate people out? So I think that dichotomies are always um, problematic, right? So this kind of, do we do the same for everyone or do we single out folks? And, and I, I think that there's in between. So I think that there, one thing that we failed at doing is sort of um, providing a fundamental quality education for everyone. Um, so just beginning with that premise. Um, the second is this idea of personalized education. That's become something that we talk about a great deal. Um, so how do we create um, classrooms, schools, and educational experiences that allow students to follow their curiosities? The fact is that classrooms don't allow um, the exploration um, because there's a timetable and a curriculum that one must deliver and get through. Um, there's a conversation about who's gifted. That's not a conversation that I'll enter in today, but I do want to ask the question, how do we measure giftedness? And isn't it surprising who ends up being designated as gifted uh, typically is someone who is more upper middle class or middle class, male, um, and in a US context, white. Uh, isn't that a problem uh, that should ask, <laughs> cause us to ask that question? Mm -hmm. So I think that where there are examples everywhere around the world in schools and classrooms and teachers who are providing that mm -hmm. kind of thoughtful, rich, exploratory, and rigorous education. Um, so the question is, how do we learn from those examples? They're everywhere. And the second is, how do we scale up? And the third is, do we really have the will to support that for everyone? Thank you. Thank you. Anyang, uh, we, were, we, we were talking yesterday, about you were telling me how 
with your gifted students, uh -huh. you have this lovely <laughs> metaphor of snorkeling. You allow them to yeah, yeah, right. uh, explain uh, that to uh, uh, everyone. Okay. Uh, actually, knowledge is so vast, like the ocean. So imagine yourself snorkeling in the ocean. If you just uh, deep dive and explore uh, every area, and uh, eventually we'll learn of grass, right? Uh, so what can you do? We cannot explore everywhere, right? So we have to scan the surface, and we have to find out the spot interest to us, right? It's education exactly the same, right? At first, we have to scan the surface. So we have to provide many areas to students, and the students have, should have freedom to select their major, their interest, what they like. And that they can probably deep dive and immerse themselves, and that they can passion it and creativity. So that's why I want uh, students should be exposed to many research activities, many international exchange programs, and some elective courses, many elective courses. And then they can be uh, probably a trigger, it can be, it can trigger curiosity, read questions, more creative, more passionate. Mm. Okay. Mm. So, so, yes. Uh -huh. so, yeah, it seems to fit perfectly with the purpose of education being mm -hmm. to find what triggers one's mm -hmm. curiosity. Well, I, th I think we're so they just coming back to that very important question. So I think mm -hmm. the, 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 the big problem here is that when we talk about uh, uh, education, it's not the same about, uh, as, uh, uh, as when we talk about schools and universities, because schools and universities is not, are not only uh, giving the function of education and, and providing knowledge, they're also giving the functions of uh, social lifts, of, the, uh, of, the, of great equalizers, and, and so on. And as, uh, if we uh, and those are competing functions. And if you keep providing these uh, controversial demands to our schools and, and universities, you, we keep getting these this, uh, strange results that uh, we have, rather than equality, we get inequality from, from the education. Thank you. But are, are they conflicting demands, Jules? Do you think, do you think that, that you, can, you can cover both? I think we can have both. I think we need to balance. Life is about balancing. Yep. So when you go to one extreme and leave the other extreme, then I think this is where the problem starts. I begin to believe now, after the pandemic, that school has been too much on livelihood, or education has been too much of livelihood. Everybody wants to come to university because you want to be successful in a, in a certain way. Somebody say, this is success, you know, a celebrity or whatever, fame and names. Yeah? But we forget about life altogether. So when the pandemic comes, you do not know how to organize our life. When we are locked down for a week, we can manage. But two weeks, three weeks and more after that, we do not know how to manage life. We do not know how to deal with ourselves when you're alone. The whole problem of now is about loneliness. Despite all the networks that we talked about, loneliness is the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. and how does this connect? You've got all the networks, you get all the, you know, the likes and whatever it is that you're used to, but yet loneliness is a problem. And how do you deal with this? I think we need to come back to this balance, Adam. How do you balance livelihood and life? Mm -hmm. You know you have got so much in livelihood, but what is your life? Some successful people, sometimes their lives are very miserable. Mm -hmm. People who are economically not well off, their lives sometimes are better, they are more happier, they are, you know, they, they are cheerful, they don't grumble so much. So to get this balance and to bring it back into education, and I do agree that education is not just classroom. The whole world is about education. You are here, it is part of education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you broaden this perspective, mm -hmm. the perspective that everywhere you go, you learn? Mm -hmm. I come here, I learned a lot, and I see all the things that have been done. So learning is a process that goes on 24 hours, 24-7. How do you deal with this? I think we, this is what I think the issue mm -hmm. for the future. Mm -hmm. a provocative question. So just uh, in the long run, how your students are, are doing? So, uh, <laughs> so, um, how many are, so in comparison with the regular school? Uh, so it's difficult how many of them are CEOs, I don't know, or professors, or doctors? Uh, so actually, 
uh, we are, our education purpose to nurture well-rounded individual, actually for society, but it's uh, like Nobel laureate, it's a special purpose, it's the, like yeah, Nobel laureate. Let's, yeah. let's cut that. Let's <laughs> but actually, our, uh, actually, initially, we try to nurture uh, young people to be the, uh, Actually, it's honestly, it's a Nobel laureate, really. It's a science, Nobel no, laureate. Nurturing laureates, okay. Uh, uh, laureate yeah, scientists, yeah. scientists, yeah. Uh, and then, finally, they can contribute to society, right? It's uh, as a uh, society. But now, we want to make them happy, right? It's, uh, individual happiness is very important, yeah. right? Mental health, like that. So, actually, we want to uh, nurture some kind of it's the first I commented well on the individual, right? So they can less stressed and much happier, right? Much happier and also creative, and they can also function in the society, right? It's, it's very ideal. That's ideal, idea. but okay. yeah. It's, it's, difficult, yeah, it's uh, difficult to measure how people uh, have done, isn't it? Yeah, right. Um, let's have another comment, please. There's a lady here, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Can we turn the microphone on? Thank you, Grace. Oh, hello. Oh, thank you so much. I have a question for Professor Sir Costa Navasolo. And as I know, you have visited a lot of countries, and mm. you must be experienced a lot of educational systems. And which one most were the best or maybe the most impressive, remarkable? Thank you so much. <laughs> mm. well, thank you for, for this question. And, um, <laughs> I don't really, uh, it's difficult to say, but I think uh, I, I can tell you from my experience. Okay? So what I'm really grateful for uh, for my life that I had, I, I had a chance to try different things. At a certain moment, I actually pr pr pretty much quit the university. I had my own uh, con construction business. I was, I was earning money for, for, for some time, and then actually good money. And then, but then I was lucky that I tried it, and uh, I figured it out that that's not what I want to do in life. And you really need to try to uh, in, in quite, um, uh, in quite um, not... Uh, being, being already adults, because you are, so when you are 16, 17, that's very difficult. And coming back to, to that question, I think, I, I think it's really important to, uh, have, to have a try for many different, many different things. And in, in this sense, there's liberal art education in US, where, where when you have this first year of just exploring things, I mean, okay, some people explore different things, so they just, uh, uh, so beer and, and, and all the other just types, <laughs> but, but a, a lot of students actually explore different courses and select their, uh, their, uh, their the, the direction of, of, of education during the, this year. And I think this is a very, uh, very nice example of very good education. But you became, a, you, you had a construction business and then you became a Nobel laureate at the age of 36. Yeah. So something in your education, presumably in Russia, gave you incredible confidence that you sort of at least knew who you were. You moved fast. Well, that's, uh, uh, but, but that's actually exactly what, nothing can push you to move fast, a part of yourself. And, and this self-motivation is extremely important. And when I hire my PhD students, of course, I look at their background and, and knowledge, but self-motivation is probably the dominant characteristic. So if, if they're not motivated, if they're not curious by themselves, I won't be able to, to drive them. And that's what, what really helped me, that I, I really tried many different things, and I mm -hmm. definitely knew for sure that science and condensed metaphysics is exactly what I want to do. Mm. In a way, that's the gift, isn't it? The gift is to discover. But you, uh, it's very difficult to, to uh, discover it when, when, when you are 
uh, 17. So it's really, you, you really need to try uh, different things. Mm. Mm. In, the, in the little time we have remaining, does anybody want to pick up on that? Joel? But to try different things, I think, is what education is all about. You do not know who you are until you try a variety of things. It's just like food, you know. If you're just used to one food, you think that's the only thing. But when you try a variety of food, then you know which one you like. And you can then channel your interest. And this is where I agree with you, the self-motivation is something that is very crucial in driving you. So you don't have somebody else to supervise you. You supervise yourself, and mm -hmm. that's what education is all about, I think. Mm -hmm. And something that I was reflecting on when we, did the when we named the panel um, the purpose of education, it's strange because the meeting is called the future of learning, and everybody likes learning, but a lot of people don't like education. So finding out what you like is, for many people, a complete failure with education. At the end of the day, they haven't liked it at all. What do we do about that? Lynn, would you like to? So I've been thinking about this whole idea of interest um, and finding out what you like. And I completely agree uh, with my fellow panelists that there isn't enough um, sort of exploration and experimentation in schools that enable young people mm -hmm. to try things out. Quite often you're trying things out for the first time at university level. Um, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you, know, you take the beer route because you've never had any experience sort of being thoughtful about your own education. Um, but I want to talk about motivation as well. And sometimes we think of motivation as mm -hmm. something that's sort of imposed from the outside or something that some learners have and some don't. Um, but I want you to think about a young child, a five-year-old, mm -hmm. who is uh, completely engrossed in something for hours. They say children can't sit still. Well, they can sit still for things they really want to do. Mm -hmm. If you think about someone learning how to skateboard, have you watched young people learning how to skateboard for hours on end, falling, 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 and getting up? That's mm -hmm. motivation. Mm -hmm. So motivation is connected to this desire mm -hmm. to attain something that you mm -hmm. care about. Mm -hmm. It's true. In the case of my teenager, though, it's probably spending hours looking at their <laughs> telephone. <doing this. laughs> that, unfortunately, is all we have time for on this panel. But it's been a lovely start to the day. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. Thank you. And I thank you for the you. questions. Um, we'll have more chance to have the audience participate later in the day. In a short while, Lynn is going to moderate a panel following on from this one on the important question of equality. And to set the scene for that, uh, I'm going to invite Anna Dadio, who is a senior policy an analyst at UNESCO, to give an introductory talk in which she'll also touch on the question of how, digi how the digital revolution is changing education. S but for now, to all my panelists, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.